It's nine o'clock. It's your call. Should Britain ban the veil? The Conservative MP Philip Hollibone thinks so. His private member's bill outlawing burkas, niqabs and other face coverings, including balaclavas, is on the list of motions to be discussed in Parliament later today. He says it's not acceptable in 21st century Britain. We're never going to have a fully integrated society where everyone can speak to everyone else and see who everyone else is if a large number of people are going around with their faces covered. You're, you'll be all right on Halloween. Entertaining, entertainment purposes and entertainers will be exempt from the rule which raises its own questions but France and Belgium already have similar bans the Netherlands is considering one too is it time we followed suit? would it help Muslims and non-Muslims integrate better? does the government have the right to tell people what they can and can't wear? would a ban infringe on people's rights or, or liberate them? is it once again uh, men setting the agenda? He's back with us, actually, Conservative MP Philip Hollibone. Thank you for taking the time to dis discuss this with the nation, uh, Mr Hollibone. It's, it's very much appreciated. It's a pleasure. Good morning again. And Shaista Gahir joins us as well, who is a chair of the Muslim Women's Network. Uh, uh, Shaista, good morning to you. Good morning. What do you think about any proposal to ban it by law, Shaista? I think it's uh, an extremely disproportionate um, response, really, um, and I just can't understand it. Um, and I can only imagine that the only reason for it, it being put forward that, um, is for reasons of prejudice, because you only have to look at the statistics in, in, in Europe. So if you, for example, were in France where it's been banned, the government initially saying 1,900 women um, were wearing it, but independent research showed that 367 women were wearing it and then in 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 um uh, holland um a few dozen women um apparently wear it so if you look here in the uk no one's got any firm statistics but here you've got a population of 2.8 million muslims so 1.4 million muslim women um let's just be generous and say a thousand women wear, are wearing the face veil that's face veil that's less than 0.1 percent now, by banning the face veil of 0.1% of Muslim women, how are you going to help the other 99.9% .9 of women to integrate? So it's a very weak and ludicrous argument, I'm afraid. Uh, do you like it? Um, I personally uh, don't agree with the face veil. I don't cover my head and I don't wear the face veil. However, as a women's rights activist, I would vigorously defend the right of women to decide um, what they would um, like to wear themselves, as long as it's, it's their own choice. Um, you know, just as, for example, in Iran and Saudi Arabia, you have the moral police where they are uh, telling women that they must cover their head, cover their face. I'm against that. Um, equally, I'm opposed to anyone um, in other countries, you know, including in Europe, telling women that they must um, uncover. And what you will notice, the, the commonality between what's happening in those countries and, and in the West. It's men leading the debate. How dare men tell women what to wear and what not to wear? Women may need to make those decisions for themselves. Philip Hollibone. Well, my bill doesn't mention women. Uh, it's not discriminatory. It bans anyone from covering their face, whether it be a burqa, a full-face balaclava, or anything else. Well, first of all, I mean, how many people walk around in the street um, wearing um, a, a balaclava or, or, or a biker's helmet, um, that they're not considered um, pieces of, you know, something that you would wear, a normal piece of clothing. So I do think that, you know, you're just hiding behind that, those kinds of excuses because for, for some women, they choose to wear that as a part of their faith. Some do it out of fashion or culture. Some believe it makes them closer to God. Some... Um, uh, women believe it sort of liberates them. I don't understand those arguments. What, what, have you, have you, At the end uh, of the day, uh, that's their right to make, you know, wear those clothes. Yeah, it's a piece of clothing. Yeah, F Philip Hollibone, um, do you? How much of the eyes is it acceptable to to show? Because uh, just the eyes, or if you if you show a large a larger part of the face, would that be okay? Yes, I mean that you do get down now to definitions about yeah. how much of the face should be revealed. Have you considered this? I have considered this, yeah. and it has to be some combination of the eyes, the nose, and the mouth. And obviously, it's difficult to show if you just have your eyes and the mouth, like a balaclava, for example. That isn't enough. So the nose, how much of the mouth? Uh, the whole mouth, or just? The, I mean, the, the, you... I think it has to be the. I mean, it has to be the whole mouth. Right. Well, I think the point, Nikki, is, you know, your, our friend mentioned uh, biker's helmets. If you're wearing a biker's helmet and you go into a petrol station or a post office or a shop, you're asked to remove it. 
Now, if you go into a petrol station, a post office or a shop wearing a burqa, people mm. are frightened of asking women to remove it to see who they are because of political sensitivity. But we know that there have been uh, thefts and robberies with people wearing the burqa. Mohammed Ansar, Muslim commentator. Mo, good morning. Morning, Nikki. What would, how do you react to Rob's text there? In all walks of life, we have to see the face. I don't think there's a fair argument for that. I think, uh, disappointingly, I'm on the telephone, which means people can't see my face, and clearly I'm not integrating in a, British, a modern British society. I, I think we need to make a couple of things clear. First is, if you put in place a policy which indirectly discriminates, and, and I know Philip Hollowbone may have the best and noblest of intentions, but you cannot force people to integrate, you cannot bomb people into democracy or freedom, you, 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 we cannot legislate what people wear. If you put to, in place a policy which says that um, you must wear a motorcycle helmet, um, and uh, that meant if you weren't able to wear a motorcycle helmet, you couldn't wear a motorcycle, you discriminate against seat people. And so, of course, they have an exemption. If you put in place a policy that says, uh, we don't believe you can integrate unless you're showing your face, which we know is quite an absurd statement in itself, you are absolutely indirectly discriminating against Muslims. And this is, this is almost a British form of Talibanized thinking, which says we need to legislate on what you wear. <laughs> Philip, you've been compared to the Taliban, Philip Hollabone. Well, not for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> there might be something in it, Philip, you never know. I think the point is that, that most people will get this, is that uh, when you go down the street uh, and you see someone coming the other way, part of the British way of life is smile, wave, say hello, uh, have a quick word. Imagine a society... Have you been to London recently? <laughs> yes, yes. Even in, even in London, uh, people do communicate uh, with people they might not, not necessarily be intimate with, but they might know just because they recognise who they are. If we have a society where people are covered from head to foot, so you can't see who the individual is, I think Britain would be... You know what, I'm, I'm a little bit... One second, Mo, one second, Mo, in just a second, I'll ask you a question as well. I'm not entirely comfortable with people whose face looks like a metal factory, uh, Philip. Neither am I entirely comfortable with people whose face looks like um, an art gallery. Um, but, you know what, get on with it. You know, live your life. Well, um, it... It, it, whether you're comfortable or not, uh, they have the right to have their face in that way. But my point is this, is that you can see their face. Uh, if you're wearing Just. a burka or a balaclava, you can't. And that's the big difference. And that's the big difference. Sir, Mo answer, what, Mohammed answer, what do you think of the niqab and the burka? What's, what's your view of it? Do you think... Do you I, think I, personally, I'm not a huge fan of it. I'm not a huge fan of it. The, the niqab, the, the, the burka, the full face veil is not uh, particularly prescribed in Islam. I mean, it's, 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 not, it's not mandated in Islam. The head, scarf, the veil, the khimar, also known as the hijab, certainly is. I'm not a huge fan of it, but I am... A so, huge hang on, well, that's interesting. Right. That's the, the headscarf. If you're a Muslim woman, you have to wear a headscarf. Well, it, it, look... It, that's it, your interpretation. Relevant. There are lots of different interpretations, absolutely, and there'll be scholars who say it isn't, there are scholars who say it is. However, all the schools of thought are, are on a consensus on the issue. But this isn't really about the headscarf, this is about the full face veil. And I'm not a massive fan of it, however I am a fan of um, uh, liberal freedoms. And I think if people want to wear that, we should allow it. And I think one thing that Philip actually isn't perhaps recognising is that also part of living in British society is about balancing rights and freedoms and democratic freedoms as well. And actually, if a woman says, I insist on wearing this, it's part of my religious identity, my cultural identity, it's part of my modesty, and she insists on wearing it, by banning it, you are pushing those people to the margins of society. You are saying, you must stay at home, you will not be allowed to integrate you will, as you are, you will not be allowed to be included in society. So in fact, your uh, proposal is a retrograde step, it's regressive. If you want integration, as has been shown in France, this is going to produce the absolute opposite. Philip Holloburn, well, let's get a com another comment from you. Then we're going to do the travel news. Lots of calls coming in, and I'll come back to you, Philip. But do you want to just respond to that? Well, I think if somebody covers their face so that nobody who can see who they are, they are, in effect, pushing themselves to the margins of society. Mm. Could you have somebody reading the news wearing uh, one of these things, Mohammed Ansar, in this country? Do you think that would ever be acceptable? Um, I, do you know, I, I think in, in, in British society, the way British Islam is, we... we, we we probably wouldn't go for it. It's not our cup of tea, to be honest with you. 
However, I think if somebody wanted to have a go and they wanted to try, why not? I mean, live and let live. There are bigger fish to fry. Is that what it's about? Worrying Le- and legislating about what women wear. Shortly. Okay, live and let live. Is that what it's Selena, about? Selena, good morning. Good morning. All yours. <laughs> um, I was just listening to the radio and I'm quite shocked and a bit disgusted. Um, I don't cover my face. I cover the rest of myself. Um, I don't feel that I'm causing anybody any harm. Um, I just feel that by doing this, and where does it all end? It's going to be covering, not covering your face and not covering your hair, then telling us what to wear and telling us how to drive. I mean, I heard a debate this woman was saying that she drives in the Rochdale and Berry area. She gets cut up regularly by people that cover their face. I get cut up regularly by all kinds of drivers. It doesn't mean because someone's covering their face, they don't know how to drive. Mm. Um, obviously, they know how to drive because they've passed the test by the UK law. Um, do, can I ask you, do some of your, your Muslims, do you know, do you have Muslims? sisters, as it were, within the Muslim communities that, yeah. you, that you know that, that do cover their face. Yeah, uh, I've got loads of friends. Uh, I've got friends that cover, that yeah. don't cover. Why? Is, are they being forced to do so? Or is Not it absolutely at all. I mean, I was, I, I was just thinking that the majority of the women that I know that cover, they're actually the nicest women that I know. They're so polite, they're so, you know, warm, welcoming and everything. It, just because they cover their face doesn't mean they're negative, that they're negative or they're nasty people or they're burglars or they're going to attack you. And, and what's the thinking about Behind, just tell us, Selena, why do they cover their faces? Is it something about n- not being desired by the opposite sex? For, no, um, I think even foremost is it's the fact that they want to cover their beauty, or they've been, you know, I mean, they've got strong faith where they've got strong religion, and within themselves they know that in the Quran it says you cover yourself, you cover yourself, and you you keep yourself modest. And so why don't men cover their face as well if it's about the opposite? Because it's not been, it's not in, it's not in Islam for a man to cover. And well, why not though if they're if the logic because is with, within the Quran, it says that they just have to be modest and lower their gaze. You know, they're not supposed to look at women in in a disgusting way, or you know, g- glare at them in a way where a woman feels uncomfortable. And the same for a woman that a woman can't look at a man and glare at him. And you know, it, it's just the one glance. You look, you look away. And it's not just because. So be, it's not a bit unfair that Muslim uh, women ha- have to, according to some interpretations, cover their faces, and, that, but and men don't because men, it, men are as attractive, men are as sexually attractive <coughs> to women as women are to men. Of course, but by statistics, and as you know, being a man, are men not more so attractive to women? No. <laughs> if, if, if you think about it, that a woman is much more attractive than a man, yeah? That uh, men are I think so, but I know women who disagree, women and I know a lot of men who disagree. If you want to step out into that newsroom... Sorry? Sorry, sorry go on. I don't want to I'm just you. saying that I, 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 I think men are as attracted to women as women are to men, and men to men, and women to women, and that's the way of the world. Women are not less attracted yeah. to men. No, no, I'm not saying they're, lot, they're not less attractive, but... For a woman, it's, I think it's more important for her to look after herself, for her to cover herself, and for her to, you know, represent <coughs> herself in a way that mm. she's not being... Interesting. Peter in Reading. Hi, you come in, Peter. Well, thank you. No, I think what you're trying to say is that uh, women are inferior to men, and if you believe yeah. in Islam, that's, that's... I'm afraid that your religion clearly states they are. Ch- chapter 4, verse 34, the Holy Quran states that men it are states inferior, that to, inferior to men. Women are inferior to men because Allah has made them that way, and the men can beat their wives. Well, if you believe in Islam, you if you believe if it the Quran, the Quran, there would be no existence of man. Four verse thirty-four tells you where you are. You are inferior to men because Allah has made them that way, and oh. you can be beaten by your husband. That's what it's no, I don't think so. Nobody can be be beaten up by anybody, and, and it doesn't even state that in the Quran. I don't Chapter know what four, Quran. Four, with something no, with something no big, with something no bigger than a than a toothpick, it says, doesn't it? Mohammed yeah, Ansar, you, if we have you're a. You're going to beat someone up with a toothpick, are you? Yeah, Mohammed Ansar, do you want to come in here? I'm sorry. That is that is the most absurd nonsense I've ever heard of. I mean, I, I, I wrote a piece, pretty much everything he said. Um, the, I wrote a piece recently for, for the lovely Vicky Beeching for her Faith and Feminism uh, blog, I hope you don't mind me giving it a plug, but about feminism in Islam. Islam has a fantastic tradition of supporting women's rights. It, it, the Quran gave the first written Bill of Rights for women. Surah 434 actually talks about the relationship between men and women because it has clear, in Islam we have relatively clearly defined roles for men and women, although of course there's wriggle room. People can do essentially what they like on these issues. 
and and it so doesn't. It the isn't a birth that makes a No, no, no. My friend, look. I think lecturing. My friend, lecturing me on the Quran and Islam. You're definitely on a weak standing here. So honestly, in the Quran. I mean, that's what is written. No, 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 no. No, no, no. Mormon. You can learn Scientology. Okay, let's 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 let's. Mohammed, you're a very attractive man. Why don't you cover your face from me? If I find you very, very attractive, why don't you cover your face? Do I? I it's should it? I, 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 when I see you, I have to avert my gaze, obviously. Do, do you know? I, I, I tell you what, Nikki. Um, you know, it's very. And I'm, I am sitting in an office um, in Dorset, blushing. So I mean, maybe I should. But <laughs> however, <laughs> however, this isn't really. I don't believe uh, an issue about sexuality. This is an issue about how Voltaire described in the 18th century as tolerance, right? Tolerance. And for Brit in Britain, we have had a long tradition of having a tolerant and an open society with liberal values. And if somebody defines their own sexuality, their own way of life, their own religion uh, in, in a certain way, then guess what? We've allowed them to exist. And Philip Hollibone is desperately wrong if he believes that um, the, the faux British tradition is a completely made up of stopping in the street, nodding, saying hello, smiling and having a chat, is somehow diminished by the right of people to live free. Philip Holloburn. Well, when I went down Bow High Street and saw lots of women wearing full-face burkas, I didn't see... You mean a paper bag? No, women wearing full-face burkas. I didn't see much interaction, smiling, waving and saying hello. But and didn't you call it a paper bag in an immigration debate two years ago? It is, well, it is the equivalent of wearing a paper bag over your head. And how ridiculous would that be? You know, we're not a but Muslim can you, can you, country. Can you understand how people will feel offended by you diminishing and demonising and um, being so... Uh, you know, appalling in your attitude towards people's religion and their faith, something they hold very dear to them. Do you respect people? Do you respect... You one second, Philip Hollibone. Do you respect people, uh, some people, who think it just looks silly and find it offensive? Do you respect that, Mohammed? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. No. I mean, you, you, have, you have the right to find something offensive. You certainly don't have the right to legislate and remove people's freedoms. Yeah, Philip Hollibone. You cannot oppress people by removing their freedoms. Oppressive, Philip Hollibone. Well, what I find oppressive is uh, the full face veil. I, I, I do not believe that God intended for women to walk around covered from head to foot so that no one can see who they are. I, I regard that as abhorrent, uh, as I, uh, and I believe a majority of people in this country regard it as out of place in 21st century Britain. Yeah, but um, then where does it stop? Where, where, where does it stop? Today it's the face niqab, then it's going to be the hijab, then you're going to stop us from wearing Asian clothes, you're going to stop Sikhs from wearing turbans, well, no. you're going to stop girls from wearing skinny jeans. No. Where does it stop? No, but it, understand. None of that, Which none of that man. is covered in the bill, and that is the power of legislation, yeah, but of course. It's now. You're just but saying, but you're talking about it now. My bill is very, very tightly defined. Can I just stop you all there? Uh, Good morning. Uh, Philip Hollibone, the Conservative MP, is still with us. Reason being, uh, he thinks, that, well, he's got this private member's bill uh, at Long Burkers, Nick Cabs, and, and other face coverings. It's on the list of motions to be discussed in Parliament today. We have had loads of texts. Loads of calls on this. We all, we've got Philip, we've also got Mohammed, Mohammed Ansa, political and social commentator. L Lila, is it, in the, in the yes. London area? Hello. Hello, yes. It's great Lila. to hear women's voices on this. I, I think it's so imp it's important because the, it's, the whole debate seems to be dictated by men. Lila, what would you like to say? Well, I think you make a very relevant point there that, um, that men commenting on women's clothes isn't something that we really want to hear. Um, I'm a British revert to Islam. I've been a Muslim for 13 years, and for 10 of those years, I wore niqab. I mean, you're calling it in your program burqa. I don't think many women in the UK wear burqa. They wear a face veil, which is uh, we, we call niqab. What's the burqa? Is that the full... That's as you would see the women in Afghanistan wearing, which covers from their head right down to their waist or lower than that. I see it's quite a lot in the... In the, in the, uh, uh, in the place to see it is the Cromwell Road going to the big private hospital in London where you live. But anyway, go on. OK, so I was wearing the niqab um, for 10 years, and um, I, I had actually a little problem with that. As, um, as everyone knows, uh, London is very multicultural. Of course, there was a few incidents, but nothing major, and I was quite secure and happy wearing it. However, um, about two years ago, I remarried, and my present husband um, became uncomfortable with uh, 
with me wearing it outside, he felt that he was getting all of the evil eye, all of the nasty looks, as if he's the one that's suppressing me, making me wear it. And after about six months, I decided, uh, for his sake, to take it off. And I believe that that in itself is a, a kind of an, ex a, a, an oppression on how I wish to express myself and the clothes that I want to wear. Because as a British woman, primarily, I believe that this country um, has freedom of expression and and, and that women should be free to wear, wear, wear almost what they what they wish. You see, oh, women free to not wear anything. Free. Yeah, exactly. So what? Yeah. What, what, what incidents? If I go and buy myself a female uh, niqab or burqa to walk down the streets of Doncaster <laughs> tomorrow. Will the people around me accept me for what I'm wearing because I want to wear it? Will the police stop me and demand I take it off? In fact, do they have the the, the powers to do so? Uh, as a man, if I want to wear a balaclava and walk down Doncaster Street, am I accepted? Is that acceptable? Lila? I have no idea because I don't know any men that want to do that. And I guess that if you have a, um, a basis in, in your relig a religious belief that you want to do something, then, then surely you have the right in this country to express yourself. Uh, what kind of incidents, if I may, and what kind of incidents, if I, if I may <coughs> ask you, were you subjected to when you did wear the full veil? Well, I occasionally, I mean, you just get silly comments, don't you? Sort of, you know, go back to your country kind of thing, um, which you just brush off. I mean, people um, are not terribly aggressive, and um, I didn't find so anyway. The worst incident I actually had when I was wearing it was outside the French embassy at a protest when France um, made it illegal, and the EDL came along and, and stormed violently into our protest and ended up fighting there. Um, and I did say to one of them, as he was pinned on the floor and being handcuffed by a police officer, I said, did you think you were going to liberate us when he came here? I think, I think what people need to do is um, interact with women um, wearing, you know, once you interact or know somebody who wears niqab and realise that behind the face veil this is a normal human being with a mind and, and who is able to express themselves, um, <clears throat> then, then you, you get over that initial you know, barrier um, that you might have. But unfortunately, the media has, has obviously stirred this uh, minor issue of a very, very small number of Muslim women wishing to wear this up into a big political, um, <clears throat> um, you know, Nonsense. issue where they're even, you know, this Nikki is presenting this as a, as a case to the House of Commons. I really think this country has uh, more important things to deal with. Philip Hollerborn, how, how significant an issue is this in, in British cultural life? Yes, of course, there are far more important issues for Parliament to discuss, but it's a private member's bill Friday, and it's a legitimate subject to raise. It is a concern for many people, and it's a growing issue. As we've heard from several callers, the number of women wearing burqas seems to be going up year on year, but we also have a growing problem... Seems to be. Absolutely. But the evidence and why shouldn't they? And why shouldn't they? Because I it, mean, it, the people who are wearing burqas don't want a job, they don't want to work. We're never going to have a fully integrated society if people go around covering their faces. And we're also seeing a growing number of protesters in demonstrations wearing the balaclava. And if they're proud of what they're standing up for, then they should have the guts to show their face. If, if you, as you say, I, I would imagine you're referring to the EDL who have taken up wearing balaclavas. Why, why do women have to lose their right to wear the niqab because the EDL are wearing balaclavas? That just doesn't make sense, does it? Well, my bill applies to men and to women, and it prescribes anyone from covering their face. But you have an exemption for Halloween masks and entertainment purposes. <laughs> yep, there are exemptions for um, health and safety, sporting activity. Well, what about those Japanese tourists who have those anti-pollution um, masks? That yes. They uh, are, they ex are, they ex are they exempt? They, that would be exempt under three little c for reasons of health or safety. Right, got you. If Muslim women wear it as a, as a religious... Um, item but the EDL wear it as a as a political protest to say we want to show you know then why do people say that in Islam this is a p political statement to well, wear the niqab it isn't it's a religious it's a religious issue let's bury but this the myth EDL is a political statement let's yes bury this myth once and for all wearing the full face burqa or the niqab is not a religious requirement nobody's saying it's a religious requirement however um, it, it is something that we're allowed to do we you know nobody the issue is not whether it's compulsory or not i mean presumably it's certainly an expression of faith and identity i think there's yeah. no question about that yeah it's an expression no of faith I think, 
I, I'd be interested. In, Philip Hollibone, you, you, you talk regularly about integration, and I think, can we not now move the conversation on from integration to one of contribution? This isn't about some false concept of integration, because when do we cross that line? When are we integrated enough? You're actually talking about assimilation. Integration is about respecting people's rights, respecting people's mm. freedoms, and allowing them to be themselves. We had some research out recently that said 83% of Muslims are proud to be British citizens compared to 79% of the general public. In fact, British Muslims um, strongly identify more with Britain than British Christians. But you said do. earlier on, Mohammed, how dare anyone tell anyone else what to wear, right? You said that Absolutely. earlier on. Yes, yeah, so why, I mean, you've, you've tweeted in the past, every school of Muslim thought agrees that the headscarf is obligatory in Islam. So yeah, but you're telling people what, you're, you're telling... Yeah. What? But, but uh, Nikki, nobody's some going to my, parliament. No, I'll tell you what, uh, let, me, let, me, members, let me come back on that. Yeah, you may come, let of course come back you may that, come okay, back right? on that, yeah. Thank you, Nikki. Um, I, I, you also are, by the way, very attractive, may I add? Um, Avert your some gaze. Of my, uh, some of my, look, one of my daughter wears a full face veil. One of my daughter wears a hijab. Another one of my daughters doesn't wear the headscarf at all. This is an issue of tolerance and it's an issue of personal responsibility and personal freedom. What is religiously mandated is not necessarily legally mandated. And I find it just as abhorrent for Fear Pollabone or any member of parliament to be legislating against British virtues of tolerance. Prime Minister David Cameron has talked about tolerance being virtuous. We have a conservative home who have disenfranchised uh, Philip Hollowbone and disavowed him of his, of his views and, and saying that actually tolerance is important. That other great Tory, Tony Blair, has also talked about well. tolerance being a core, Brit <laughs> being a core British Stop value. Stop playing to the gallery. Philip, right, listen. Philip Hollowbone is on the extremes of society. He is on the margins. He's like an Anjum Chowdhury on this issue. I don't he needs to recognise... <laughs> you recognize called him the Taliban earlier on. Listen, I have to stop you there for one <laughs> second. We'll come back to all this, of course. And we are getting many calls. Let me just... Angela in Exeter in Devon. Hello, Angela. Are you there, Angela? I'm here. Oh, good, excellent. We're with you in a second. Miriam Francois Sarah joins us from Oxford University's Islamic Society. Hello, Miriam. How are you? Hi, Nikki. How are you? Uh, well, not, yeah, not so much uh, Oxford Islamic Society these days, but still Oxford. That's oh, sorry. We, we will we'll update our database. I'm so <laughs> sorry about that. Let, listen to no our, listen to Angela and respond to to sure. her on this. I think it's it, this is a it should be a women's women's debate uh, largely, and I'm glad we've achieved that at this point as well. Angela, what's your point? Not entirely sure why it should be a women's debate. The poor old MP is just trying to. Um, do what is culturally correct in Britain, and that is to recognise that covering your face in any way has sinister connotations. It's nothing to do with, or it's not about Muslims, it's about health and safety, it is about um, 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 what's the word, courtesy, it's about um, <laughs> knowing who you're talking you to. You don't think this is a Trojan horse for prejudice? I, I think I think this is the um, British broadcasting doing their normal. Let's um, bump up the Muslims again. It's also biased to the Muslims. What do you mean by bump? About that at all? Yeah, well, okay, so it's just generally. You believe Philip? It's just genuinely about covering the face. This bill, yeah. This mm. this private members' bill, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I I was asked to say in one word, um, would I agree to the veil or not? It's not about the veil. It's about whether or not you go around in public with your face covered um, and up, quite possibly being up to no good, but how can anybody tell? Miriam. Oh, poor Philip Holloban. I, I do feel sorry for him, an MP in an area which has in all likelihood no women who wear face veils at all, being so concerned about this issue that he's oh, actually refusing to see women... Excuse me, may I finish my point, veil. please? Sorry, you're interrupting. Well, um, you're refusing to see women... Uh, his, refusing to see potential constituents, I think that's a far more concerning issue, the idea that any MP in this country could say, I'm refusing to see any of my constituents. That's um, in many ways uh, much more of a concern to me. But this is, this is the same man who's proposing, this is one of 40 bills him and a few of his UKIP aspirant buddies are trying to put forward alongside returning capital punishment, withdrawing us from the EU, and renaming one of the bank holidays in August, Margaret Thatcher Day. So that gives you some idea of where uh, Mr. Hollowbone is coming at this from. I think you can look at France and see the impact the that the face veil has had on this issue. Hang on, one, one at a time. Let, let, Miriam, let, let, let Miriam finish, please. Can I just finish my point? I just want to finish don't, my don't point. Don't cover her voice. 
She's making, um, she's can I just finish my point, please? Um, I just wanted to say what we can look at is one of the countries where this law has actually been brought into force, and that's France. Uh, one, uh, and in France, unfortunately, this law has actually served to further victimise Muslim women who wear the face veil. There have been several vigilante attacks uh, on Muslim women, people who think that they can go along in the street and attack Muslim women and think that they're enforcing the law by doing so. And I think it really, if you're concerned about any women, in, um, Muslim women in particular, the idea is you don't legislate which could further, further marginalise these women. You offer support groups, you offer grassroots uh, means of supporting these women. And I think we just have to clear up the whole um, uh, health and safety or whatever it is that's often put forward, the sort of uh, straw man argument that uh, security is at risk. Um, in France, for example, where the face veil is now banned, um, it was the case that you, and it still is obviously now, that you can walk up to somebody and ask them for their uh, ID to be checked, and they will lift their face veil and be identified. And that's the same situation here. So I don't see how that would be an issue. You okay. can go up to somebody, ask them to check their identity, and then they move on with their day. All right, that's, okay. that's the British way. Angelo, quick word back. That's well, the you British can't, way. You can't ask them to check that somebody's ID, um, ID if they're caught on CCTV camera doing a robbery when they're covered in a balaclava. Hey, Martin. That's quite, you know, again, you've got to bend it towards the Muslim question. It's deeper than that. And like I say, it, it's the protection of my culture. Why can't we have my culture being looked after. Why does it always have to be the Muslim culture that's looked after? I and thought it wasn't a Muslim issue. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's the point, all right, let's really? move it to Martin in Hertfordshire and then Saima in uh, Rochdale. Saima, hello. Hi. Martin first. Uh, hi there. Yeah, hi, Nikki. Um, just want to tell you, um, with tolerance is being used an awful lot in this uh, debate, and uh, I've just returned from Saudi Arabia. I lived out there with my wife. I think my wife should really be the one speaking at the moment. Um, we had to adapt immediately to the Saudi regulations. We accepted that. We were actually foreigners. So she had to wear a veil, and she had to wear, well, not a veil, she had to cover her hair, and she had to wear an abaya. We never actually demonstrated against that. Not only that, we're Christians. We weren't allowed to bring in any rosary beads. We weren't allowed to practice our faith in any shape or form. Now, there's tolerance for you. The very home of Muslim, of the Muslim faith, actually doesn't allow any other form of religion to be practiced. But to get back to the point, we actually went along with the authority, the culture of that particular country. We accepted it. We got on with it. And I just wondered, you know, when Muslims arrive here and they want to change ours, I say, well, hold on. In Saudi Arabia, we weren't allowed to change yours. Can I just come back on that, Nikki, if that's OK? I want to yeah. leave time for Saima, and we've only got a minute and a half, Miriam, if you'll allow me. Saima in Rochdale. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. I'd just like to say to the gentleman that, you know, saying that uh, obviously when we come here uh, that we're wanting the laws to be changed. We're not asking the laws to be changed. All we're saying is that every person, every human being has a right to live the way they want to. And if England or Great Britain or any country offers that liberation and offers the liberty and offers the freedom, then there shouldn't be a problem with anybody dressing the way that they want to. Well, can I suggest an idea that what you try and do is try and encourage some form of liberalism in, your, in the home of your very religion? Well, you, you're assuming that Saudi Arabia represents Muslim views and also that Muslims approve of what Saudi Arabia is doing. I think it's outrageous that you can't practice your religion in Saudi Arabia. It certainly doesn't represent my views in a Mus as a Muslim. And can I just point out that not all Muslims are foreigners, so this idea that they're coming over here is somewhat problematic. These are your fellow citizens. They have a right, as do you, to express their perspective on what ought to be British culture. And to refer to them as these outsiders coming over here is inherently problematic. But listen, I wish you all a very, very good weekend. Thank you for taking part uh, this morning. Thank you, Mo and Miriam and Philip, our MP.